Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Paul Church. I'm the Managing Director of Interquest. We're a data, tech and digital recruitment business. And this is our people, culture and tech community. Uh, we uh, created it around last July time. We were in the middle of a lockdown, one or two, I can't remember. Uh, and it's grown um, so much so we've got nearly 830 members on the meetup.org group. Uh, we've relaunched it this year as a podcast. This is the 15th week in a row we're broadcasting this podcast, still maintaining where we came from with the webinar because I so much enjoy uh, the contributions from the audience each week, uh, but now available in a more palatable form on a podcast as well. Um, typically, um, our topics tend to range between three areas, um, usually around anything around uh, DNI, anything around culture and values and mental health and mental well-being. And typically, all three of those uh, topics overlap. Uh, and today, we're going to be discussing burnout in the workplace, um, how to identify it, how to prevent it, and the responsibilities uh, on both individuals and businesses to help uh, either it not happen or help people get better if it does happen. Um, so I've got two very special guests today. Uh, I'm going to ask them to tell us a little bit about themselves. So first of all, um, welcome Dr. Tracy Leghorn. Tracy, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me to discuss this really important uh, topic and uh, with a key sort of expert on mental health uh, that we've worked in partnership with at Suez. Uh, with regards to myself, I'm the Chief HR and Health and Safety Officer at Suez Recycling and Recovery UK. And for those people that haven't heard of our business before, we are an environmental services uh, organisation and we process and manage over 11 million tonnes of waste per year through our processing facilities uh, across 300 uh, sites with just short of 6,000 people. Fantastic. Thanks, Tracy. Tell us a bit more about your background and then why this topic specifically is so, is so important to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, my background and my earlier career in HR was in uh, the public sector, uh, predominantly in the NHS, but also in social services uh, as well in a, a local council. Uh, and so I'm very passionate about health and well-being and I've been on groups at a national level looking at this from a public health perspective. But certainly when I worked uh, with the ambulance service for nine years, mental health was a big issue for us, uh, you know, very challenging roles. And that's something that I've just taken forward with me into, you know, future roles in my career. I think when the pandemic happened, you know, that was really, really helpful for, for myself uh, and for us at Suez in having that insight into actually how people, just normal people deal with catastrophic and really challenging events. And I was very keen to ensure that we really focused on mental health, um, not just the reactive, but also from the very beginning, really trying to build people's resilience so that they would be able to cope, you know, if uh, it became a prolonged issue, which unfortunately uh, it has. Fantastic. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks so much for being a part of this today. And then Simon, welcome to the, to the community. How are you doing? I'm doing really well and it's lovely to be here. Um, so it's lovely to, uh, again, my main concern obviously today, um, and people have already heard about my hair. And uh, that's one of the things that um, is kind of pressing on me at the moment, literally. Um, but yeah, it's lovely to be here. I mean, my, uh, and it's lovely to be working alongside and doing this alongside Tracy, because we are, we have, um, done such a lot of work and Tracy's really driving the mental health agenda forward as a collective approach within Suez which is brilliant um, because everyone's on board with it you know we, we're dealing with um, all the, the sort of levels within the organization which is which is brilliant um, my background is is actually in nursing uh, I, I trained as a general nurse to start with but then moved into mental health nursing and I worked for more than 10 years as a mental health nurse. And various jobs within that, from being a ward nurse, a community psychiatric nurse, 
I set up a service dealing with people who'd attempted to take their own life or who'd self-harmed in some way. Um, and then we set up a, a, one of the sort of rapid outreach teams, the, the crisis intervention teams, working with people in the, in the uh, community who were in crisis. Um, one of the things, and I'll just tie this in a little bit to the topic, I, looking back at that point, felt quite burned out. So this idea of burnt out, burnout has been there for me. And I shifted jobs. I went into, I would say I moved into to addictions. That was a, as an addictions work, not as a lifestyle choice. So one of the things that being aware of that and alert to that, um, things were happening for me, but I didn't necessarily recognize them at the time. And this is really weird. As a mental health professional, you would think I ought to know better. But how it creeps up on, on people, I think, is, is really important. So I, I shifted jobs. I moved jobs. Uh, I moved out of nursing altogether and became a lecturer in health and social care. And then I moved into what I fully expected to be my final job, which was working as the drug education team advisor for four local authorities. And I did that job uh, for nearly 10 years. And then I got made redundant. And that was quite a blow in terms of my mental health as well, but that's different from burnout. That level, that type of stress is different from what we'll be talking about in terms of burnout. Uh, and on reflection, again, it was one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Um, I set up my own business and that business has now grown into a business called Golden Tree Wellbeing, CIC, and I'm currently one of the directors of that business. And um, I also fulfilled, or I'm in the process of fulfilling a lifetime ambition to become a psychotherapist. So whilst I do Golden Tree and the training side of things, the mental health training, I also have a small private practice where I see clients clinically. And again, a lot of the stuff around stress and burnout is featuring in the work that I'm doing with people clinically, as well as on the, on the training side. So that's a, that's a potted history of, of me. And really, my interest in burnout and stress and mental health has, has been for over, well, well over 30 years, which makes me feel really old saying that, Paul. Fantastic. Thanks. So thanks. For, thanks for the intro. Um, thanks for being here today. I know how busy you are. And I do apologize again for not letting you get your hair cut before uh, the webinar. Um, next time, we know you'll be uh, all clean and fresh. I'll be shown the sheep. Yeah, exactly. Um, so to the audience, as always, please do uh, get involved whenever you feel like. If you've got a, a question or just something you'd like to share, uh, pop your hand up if you'd like to dive into the conversation yourself. If you'd like to put the the message in the chat box and I'll read it out for you. That's fine as well, but please as much audience participation as possible. So Simon, if we go, go straight back to you. So let's, let's start off by just dissecting what burnout actually is. What is the correct definition of it? And where does it sit in terms of diagnosis and categorization? Cause we talked, you mentioned earlier, it's not the same as mental wellbeing. It doesn't quite fall in that. So let's, no, let's go through it. I think a lot of this stuff exists on a continuum and I'm always cautious when we use the word diagnosis. And again, I think what we, we can give a diagnosis. We can sort of use the diagnostic terminology if, if we think about burnout actually existing as a condition. It's identified as a condition in the, one of the big books of mental health disorders, the ICD-10, the International Classification of Psychiatric Disorders. Um, and they've got it down as um, it's a type of psychological stress. And occupational burnout or job burnout is characterized, and I'm reading it here, by exhaustion, lack of enthusiasm and motivation, feelings of ineffectiveness, and also may have the dimension of frustration or cynicism, and as a result, re reduced efficacy in the workplace. Isn't that really interesting? When I think back to where I was, if it's not too much of a pain for me to say this to, to, to people, my goodness, I had all of those things. But it wasn't that kind of, didn't feel like a stress response. Because this is about not necessarily a, a, a high period of stress. This is about stuff creeping up on someone. And there's a little, and I've never done this, but I read this and I just think it's a really interesting thing when we think about burnout. If you put a frog in some water apparently allegedly if you put a frog in some water and then gently turn up the heat it will boil alive 
If you've got hot water and your frog jumps in that hot water, it will jump out straight away. And I just think it's a really interesting thing when we think about where this fits. It's about unrelenting pressure. It's about unrelenting stress that seems not to kind of um, go away. And, and we get this set of symptoms at the end of it, this set of symptoms of distress at the end of it that we call burnout. Does that make sense, Paul, as I'm, as I'm saying that? So. Absolutely. I think, you know, the crucial point here, I think, with the, with the frog uh, anecdote, mm -hmm. I think, is around it, every day things can get a little bit worse, but it may be so gradual you don't notice it in yourself uh, until you get to a point where... Yeah, well, I think that's a really important point. We spent some time on, on the various bits of training that we've done within Suez. There's a, a lovely curve some of your, your um, listeners and, and viewers may be aware of. It's called the yerkes dodson curve. And it looks at stress, it looks at stress and pressure. And we all need a bit of pressure in our life. Because actually the other end of burnout could be rust out, where we, we, we just have no motivation to do anything because we don't have sufficient pressure in our, yeah. in our lives. You know, you can't turn that rusty nut because there's nothing there. Yeah. If you move up that, you get the optimism, the, the sort of enthusiasm, the creativity, the energy is there to that optimum point of, of, of pressure. It can then start to dip over and people can start to get those signs and symptoms of stress. That then goes down, so you get that rattiness, that snippiness, that sort of a little bit of disengagement, right down to burnout where we've got those fundamental symptoms that are talked about. But at that point of the tipping point, there's something called the zone of delusion. And the zone of delusion is where that individual perhaps themselves is not necessarily recognizing what's happening to them. Mm. And this is why I think with, with, with the work that we're doing with Suez and the, the work that Suez are doing themselves is actually those proactive measures about what we need to do to keep ourselves well, but also that reactive response for others to notice and go, what's going on? What's mm. happening for you? And importantly, not what's wrong with you, but what's happened or what's happening. Because then we cite it in that person's experience, what is going on for them and, and what can they do to um, get out of that situation, take control. Mm. And that can be really difficult. I mean, it sounds, sounds a simple thing, but it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. I think, so we, I think we, do, we, we look uh, at that response. Yeah, we you just need to acknowledge as well that, you know, this isn't a phenomenon that's just come out of the pandemic. You know, this was, no. this was with us well before the pandemic. Um, reports and evidence uh, from research was saying that, you know, year on year, there had been an increase in burnout. Um, for example, you know, every year uh, on year from 2017 onwards, 40% more searches on Google for the term uh, burnout, you know, so people trying to understand, you know, what that means and perhaps what, you know, is happening within themselves. Um, and, you know, record levels of burnout ahead of the pandemic, which obviously only adds to that, that pressure cooker, so to speak. Um, so this isn't something that's going to just disappear after the pandemic um, and we need to look at this in the longer term. What, what it, if we look at the, what, the workplace Tracy what, what are the typical signs of burnout in the workplace that you've seen or you hear about um, what are the, the I suppose the symptoms? I think the challenge is you know knowing those symptoms a in yourselves and b having really well-trained managers uh, and HR teams that, you know, can see them because it is very hard to identify when we're getting to the tipping point in ourselves. We know that, you know, we might feel overwhelmed. We might feel emotionally drained. Um, we might feel that we just can't meet these constant demands. Um, you know, physical things, you know, might be around, you know, feeling that emotion, maybe crying um, and not quite sure why we're crying and all those types of things. And the challenge is, you know, are your employees in a place where they feel they can share that, you know, openly with their manager or HR? 
So you've got to start by creating that environment where you're raising awareness and you're having those conversations. And as leaders, uh, you know, we're having those conversations to say, do you know, even as a leader, I have days where I feel overwhelmed, where I feel, you know, emotional. But when those days become weeks and carry on into months, then, you know, we know that perhaps we're getting to the point of burnout. So really opening up those conversations, something that we're doing at Suez in May for Mental Health Awareness Week is the board uh, are going to be having sort of focus group meetings with our employees to talk about their lived experiences around mental health. And, you know, I know having done that around um, inclusion and diversity uh, with our minority groups, um, actually there were some real light bulb moments for us as a board. And I'm sure there will be some, you know, real light bulb moments from those conversations as well. But in order to have that happen, you need employees who are bravely going to share their stories and you need to have a leadership that wants to hear them. I think that's a great point, Tracy, because I, I want to pick up on that idea that you said there. Of, it's not us and them. And I think this is a really important thing. It's like, I'm fine. It's everybody else. It's us. We all experience these things and we've got to be open to observing and listening to people. And actually, I, I was quite moved. Um, I was actually really moved today, actually. I, I was doing um, one of the assessments um, on a, well, the first aid for mental health course that I ran. And one of the chaps on the, the, the course said, yeah, af after the training the other week, um, I went to my GP because I saw myself in that training. Mm. And, and he, he went to the doctors and he's, he's got a diagnosis of, of, of depression linked to some of the stuff that we were talking about and I, I think my, my, that makes such a difference to me that, that I'm doing something that people are now getting support for but it's that acknowledgement that it can happen and in terms of the signs and symptoms I think what we're looking at is, is change across sort of three domains that, that physical side that emotional side and uh, that, that social side. So are we seeing changes in, in how that person's behaving? Mm -hmm. How are they feeling in their, their thoughts? And, what's, and then there's a whole host of physiological things that might go on. So I think we point to change in there and actually get people to acknowledge what that change might be. You know, because my, my angry, my snippy, might look very different from Tracy's angry and snippy but you will notice a change in how we are. And I think that's one of the things that we really need to be alert to, both individually ourselves, what's going on for me right now in this moment, but also the manager or, or the team members, that the community around that person, all being able to recognize and move towards that person or feel able that that person's able to move towards others. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's important and one of the things I'm you know sort of trying to get to at Suez is that you know that peer-to-peer -peer support because you know we'll often ask you know a colleague that we know uh, that we work with that perhaps you know we've become friends beyond colleagues we might feel able to you know mention something uh, to them mm -hmm. um, but we need to a uh, you know, have more employees that can recognize the signs and be, you know, give them support and the mechanisms to have that conversation with the person and get beyond the, you know, are you okay today sort of kind of, of question and actually move into the, you know, are you sure you're okay? I've noticed that X, Y, and Z, you know, is there anything I can do? I'm sure. Simon's got much better techniques than me uh, in and around that. But I think it's about moving that conversation beyond the, you know, are, just a cursory, are you okay? Which sometimes we just use like we do hello and we're not really asking the question. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a great oh, point, Tracy. That's, that, that, you know, it's a, there's been a meme on, on Facebook, you know, ask twice. Mm. ask twice are, are you okay yeah i mean the classic one is i'm fine we all know what fine stands for 
frazzled, mm -hmm. insecure, needy and emotional. That's what people will know who've heard that before, know that I've toned that down a little bit. But that, that frazzled, insecure, needy and, and emotional, that's what FINE stands for. Mm -hmm. So ask twice, are you FINE or, are you, you know, what, what's, what's going on? And importantly, because I've noticed that. What have you noticed? What's drawn you towards that person? And that will start to open the door. And listening out, I mean, particularly with burnout, with people saying that, you know, every day is a bad day. They have no energy. Burnout's almost about not enough. I haven't got enough energy to do, to, to do stuff. And I think, it's, um, I think it's really important that we think about people's levels of exhaustion and how they're feeling about the, 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 the job. You know, how are they feeling about stuff? Because it's lack, that lack of energy and engagement that you're really looking at with, with, with burnout. You know? And what burnout. we're finding is, um, you know, people's anxiety levels, you know, are higher because of the situation that we're in at the moment, inside and outside work. Um, you know, we're finding that, you know, people even before COVID were working longer hours. I think certainly within COVID, there's lots of evidence to say that, you know, people working at home are working longer hours than, than ever before. Find it hard to switch off, to put in that place those boundaries around their work day. And that work day might be in small chunks now. You know, it doesn't have to be that nine to five. We, we, we appreciate that some people have had to homeschool you know, and I've got sort of other commitments at the moment. So it's okay if they're doing, you know, a couple of hours in the evening, but it's not okay if they're starting at six in the morning and they're finishing at 12 o'clock uh, at night. So people are working longer hours. They're not taking time off when they're feeling ill. Maybe when they're at home, they feel more inclined that they can just carry on, on working uh, despite being, you know, poorly for whatever reason but certainly there's a there's a trend uh, of people not taking time off when they're sick you know some research by Aviva was around figures of or oh, you know 80 80 plus percent of people uh, uh, not taking any time off at all related to sick uh, and you know 34 percent working when they're unwell and despite they're unwell and then you add to that you know, feelings around anxiety that are leading to you not feeling fulfilled in your work life and your home life. Um, so it's, it's very dynamic, the various strains that, 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 that come into play, which lead to then being burnt out. And I think we need to be particularly concerned about young people uh, you know, the switching off, the looking at their emails, you know, after the working day is occurring much more in young people. Um, perhaps they haven't built up their resilience and their boundaries uh, around work life, around prioritising, you know, I don't know, when we have big events in our life or we, we lose someone or we become parents, we reevaluate our life and we, we put more boundaries in. Whereas young people haven't sometimes reached that point, you know, to say, well, actually, no, you know, this is beyond what's reasonable and what I can cope with. So I do think we need to, you know, look at this across the whole of the age ranges. But also, as uh, Simon was saying for us at Suez, you know, the whole range of jobs that people are doing. Yes, it's, it's, it's quite um, challenging to set those boundaries uh, around home working. But also, you know, we've had a lot of people in sewers in the, indeed the whole of the country and particularly in the NHS who have had to be out there every day doing their jobs and been absolutely relentless. Um, I think, you know, this time uh, last year, when everyone was saying we might have another lockdown in the autumn, I think we were all a little bit in denial, but yes, it came along. And not only then, but, you know, again, early into this year. Um, so it's been a marathon, not a sprint. And you've got to train differently for a Absolutely. marathon than and a think, sprint. And I think... Um... There's certainly in our end, we've seen more evidence of burnout because of the last 12 months, although, of course, it was an issue beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, though, is there still a stigma attached to it? Because and I think 
there probably is a bit, but I think for me, the good thing to come out of the last 12 months is there seems to be more empathy towards anything around this kind of arena now. And it seems to be more of a topic in the boardroom, more of a, okay, are our people okay? I think that's more of a conversation now than it was 12 months ago. But do you think there's still a stigma attached to saying, look, I'm burnt out? I, I, I would say there is still a stigma around the whole discussion around mental health issues. Yes, it's getting better. Yes, the conversation is still there. Um, and we're not we're talking about these things more. But there's, there's little doubt in my mind that the stigma still exists. Uh, one of the things that I've actually noticed, in, one of the questions I ask on the assessment part of the, the first aid for mental health is, tell me two factors that um, can affect someone's mental health. And people will invariably, if I just ask the audience just to think about two factors that can impact on their mental health, and then invite them to say they're positive or negative things. And I would suspect that in most cases, when we think about the things that affect our mental health, we will think about the negative, rather than a beautiful sunny day. The fact that we're emerging out of lockdown, that's improved my mental health. Going for a drive, spending time with family. These are the things that affect our mental health. But when we use that term mental health, even though we can now put the definition about psychological well-being, we still think about deficit. We still think about ill health. We think about problems and issues. And so whilst, yes, the debate and discussion is better, I still think we've got a way to go when we think about both ends of that continuum around mental health, about the, the good and the not so good. You know, where, where are we at? Because it's, it's still a negative view. That's, uh, that's my experience of it. And I don't know whether Tracy, you would feel the same. I don't know what two things came to your mind um, when about effects of, of mental health and where we're, where we're at. I think there's been some positive improvement around this agenda and the talking about it, you know, where we are now compared to where we were five years ago, I think is, um, you know, a very, very different place. Um, but I still think that some people um, struggle with the fact that they can't see it. They can't see it. It's not tangible. So it can't be real. Mm -hmm. um and you know a lot particularly you know i think you know in male dominated industries and businesses around you know you know that that the, the men you know should be able to cope with 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 anything you know, perhaps we're a little bit more tolerant of females and i know i'm generalizing but i think that is still stands the position that that men are expected to cope and so you know, being able to say to a colleague that actually you don't think you are coping or that you are, you know, heading towards burnout, you know, mm -hmm. is particularly difficult. Um, and, you know, we've got to, we've got to address that. And in organisations, the only way to address that is to normalise it, normalise those conversations by raising awareness and having senior leaders and managers talk about their own experiences that normalizes it then within the organization absolutely i think um, one of the key things that have come out uh, of the conversations on this this forum around anything to do with mental health and mental well-being is it starts at the top uh the top needs to display vulnerability for whatever reason um then it creates that space where others can feel they can do the same thing so if we i think it's a good segue to move on to the practical advice both for businesses and for individuals so for businesses, what, what else tracy can they do or should they be doing i suppose first to recognize if there's a problem and also to create that space where it doesn't necessarily have to become a problem as well. I think it's, it's challenging to, you know, uh, recognize the problem because lots of people who, who are prepared to sign themselves off sick generally don't put, you know, mental um, uh, health as, as an, as the, as the reason many of them, you know, put it as a cough or cold or, you know, some seasonal flu. So, you know, you have to be able to get over that hurdle. And so I would rather, and I have rather started from the position that there is an issue. It's a hidden issue, but we're kidding ourselves if we don't think it's not there. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, you know, with, uh, you know, looking in the eyes of the pandemic storm, there's no doubt 
that just normal human beings were not going to be equipped to deal with what they might have to deal with coming along, whether that's you know their fear of getting COVID themselves, their fear for their loved ones, which is often above what your fear is for yourself, uh, and you know dealing with loved ones who are ill, increasing numbers of people with long COVID, big recovery periods uh, ahead of them, and of course you know bereavement. Um, and it's like you know people say you don't know what. The person stood next to you is dealing with uh, and so I've taken it from a position of you know we've got a big issue around this and what can we put in place to help with that uh, and that has been you know um, raising awareness uh, having lots of different uh, wellness uh, webinars on all kinds of subjects whether that was anxiety stress post-traumatic stress disorder sleeping uh, because mental health is part of the holistic well-being and it's important to be physically uh, well as well as mentally well. Um, and, you know, for us, a real focus on mental health training. Uh, and Simon's, you know, trained over 400 people and we'll be training all of our drivers this year, 1,500 drivers um, that's already scheduled in and, and probably another three or 400 of the work force as well. I'd love to get to, you know, the 50% uh, of uh, our people trained in mental health. And the and that's, feedback... That's really, sorry, Tracy, I was just going to say, it's a really interesting thing that's going on with the drivers, isn't it? Because whilst we're doing a lot of sort of general awareness around mental health and mental illness, the drivers is very much a proactive approach to well-being. You know, the, the five modules there, the first one's talking about that it's okay to talk about stuff. And then the rest of it is about real proactive strategies that we do around sleep, around diet, around sort of well-being generally. So it's not a focus on the deficit. It's a focus on health, which is really important. And that recognizing that, OK, someone is struggling, there is help and support. You know, I think it's important to say this is really dynamic what's going on, because it's not just on about talking about illnesses. This is about proactive strategies that people can do. It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, as well, you know, organisations can have some of the standard things in place, you know, it's a given that, you know, should have a really good employee assistance programme. Uh, we've just uh, enhanced ours, uh, we're using uh, WeCare now, so it's access to some fantastic services there, 24 hour access to a GP, um, private, um, you know, prescriptions delivered to your door. Um, second opinion uh, by doctors on a range of, of any issues, 50,000 doctors to link into. So some really great support, but you've then got to ensure that your employees feel safe, confident to use that service confidentially um, as well. And, and also, you know, training your managers and raising their awareness, um, particularly for managers who are managing people who are working remotely, because it really is more challenging to pick up those signals and those signs when people, you know, are not physically uh, in and around you. Um, so, you know, you've, you've got to put some um, support in place for managers who actually are also having to live in a pandemic world and have the extra uh, obviously pressure of, of managing people's you know some in the office and some remotely so we mustn't always just pile it on to our managers as, a, as another you know responsibility and I've been very keen in the discussions that I've been having both at sewers within sewers group and beyond uh, when people start saying well it's managers responsibility to x y and z with regards to people's well-being of course, our managers should care about our people's well-being, but actually, ultimately, an individual's well-being rests with themselves. And so we need to give individuals, you know, that awareness and the strategies to cope. Uh, and very much, as Simon's saying there, the proactive, you know, we don't want people to get into quite a situation. So focus your attention on helping people to build up their personal and emotional resilience and the strategies around that to avoid them getting into the place where they become uh, unwell. 
And just just going to, we've got a couple of questions that come through on the chat, so I'll just just read them out. So Tracy, um, been asked by um, Addy, uh, could you elaborate on these proactive strategies to manage burnout? Um, well, just sort of really what I've um, been saying there. Um, you know, it, it is multi-dimensional. So a, you've got to start with the individual, and our wellness charter, you know, puts very clearly as its first line. You know, you, you know, your well-being is your responsibility. It's everybody's responsibility to look after their own well-being. Uh, it's no different than it's your responsibility to you know make sure that you you eat, make sure that you drink water. It's, it's, it's a fundamental of every human being to survive, isn't it? Mm. Um, but, uh, but then it is around, you know, what's the responsibility of uh, managers and how can we support them with that? You know, Chris, Chris, can I just chip in and tell a little tale about when I, when I was working for an organisation once and I, I've kind of, I get in flow. I love what I do. I get in flow and flow is brilliant. But the problem is if you're in flow too long, it's not a great place to be. That can lead to burnout. And I was at my desk and I'd open my little, I'd open my little box of sandwiches and I was eating my sandwich. But unfortunately, or fortunately, my desk was next to the chief exec of the company that I was working for, doing some training with. And his head poked out of his office and he said, Simon, we don't do that here. And I looked at him, he said, come on, let's go down to the canteen together and have a, have a sandwich. And, and I think that's lovely. Part of me is thinking, oh, blimey, I've now got half an hour with the chief exec that I didn't want. But I had that thing about we don't do that. So it's leading by example that we don't get in flow. Because Tracy's just said it's a fundamental thing that we have something to eat. How many of us eat at our desks and not take the allocated time that is given to you within your working day to have a lunch certainly in the first five years of my career uh it was very odd it was regarded to be very odd if you didn't eat lunch at your desk i'd say that uh certainly coming up in recruitment so i think yeah that rings true and then so i've got, got another question on the on the chat so i'll just go to you on this one before we, um, before we come back to this so um nila Fars asked many a times when a person complains about any issue that affects him or her and the issue is not a bigger deal for the other person the very first suggestion or reply they get is it's upon a person to let it affect you or not. So is it possible, always possible to not let things affect you? Well, what do you yeah. think to that? Well, well I, I think we are always in transaction with others. We, we, we kind of work together. I think one of the things around this, and, and again, I think Tracy's been alluding to this as well, that, that we, we accept it as real for that person. You know, that person's frame of reference, that person's window on the world is their window on the world. I might not see some of the things that are going on in your life, Paul, as a big issue, but they're obviously a big issue for you. So therefore, I want to deal with that compassionately. Mm. You know, I might not feel it, but you do. So what I need to do is actually start to get an understanding of what this is like for you. And we can do it. This isn't talking about therapy either. This isn't talking about this is just about normal human compassion. Yeah. And what we're seeing within the training that we're doing is that people are becoming, I think, more compassionate and more understanding about those things. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about this is it's never just one thing. This is, and this is the thing, the thing with burnout. It's not mm -hmm. just one thing. It's the buildup. The old analogy of it's the straw that broke the camel's back, that can be something that we, that we see. We're carrying a weight around with us for such a long time. Our energy levels go. So it's not just the fact that so-and-so moved the pen off your desk. It's all the other stuff behind that as, as well. So I do think we need to start to see things from that person's perspective. And it comes down to empathy and compassion. Absolutely. Empathy, empathy as well as thinking, absolutely. Um, so let, let's move on. So we've got about 15 minutes left. So now I think we've, we've talked about the, the business side. Let's talk about the individuals, uh, the responsibility we have on ourselves, and then maybe some tactics or some strategies we can do to prevent ourselves getting burnout whoever you are so Tracy what, what what are the things that stand out to you um I think you know if I just sort of shared my my own you know personal approach to managing my resilience and the first thing is actually knowing yourself um and taking the time to stop sometimes and just reflect on where you think you are 
and how you think you're feeling and just recognize things in and around you um, rather than, you know, sometimes, you know, especially in the last year, it can feel like hamsters on a wheel going round and round and round and round. And, you know, unless you stop, how, how are you going to see anything or recognize anything? So I think that's, that's really important for me. And I think 10, 15 years ago, I didn't have that skill. I didn't have the personal ability to do that. I would be a hamster on a wheel, just going faster and faster and thinking, I will get to the end of this. But actually, you never quite get to the end of it. Mm. Um, I think, you know, as I've learned more about this area and, you know, sort of work with lots of professionals in this area, you become better at reflecting on where you are. Um, I know when I'm getting a bit tired or stressed, uh, it's when I haven't had enough sleep at night. Um, it's when I've not ate, you know, the right foods and I, I'm, you know, diving into those sweets in the middle of the night when I'm late on emails, etc. And I know the sign for me is I feel over emotional and tearful. When I start feeling over emotional about things and a bit tearful, that is my trigger to trace your leg home, stop. You need to do something here. Um, and that is, you know, allowing yourself a break in the middle of the day to eat your lunch. People working at home at the moment, you know, you know, I'm hearing stories of people saying, I feel guilty just even running to get a coffee in case, you know, someone calls me on Teams and I'm not at my computer every second, you know. And I say to my team, you know, I don't think I have 106 people sat waiting just in case I call them. <laughs> that isn't where I, where I am and that's not where we are yeah. as an organisation. I also, think that's good on lunchtime, Tracy. I, I've now sort of blocked out 12.15 to, to 1 o'clock. I call it bargain hunt. Yeah. And I, I, I was working at home, so I've got my bargain hunt time, 12.15 to 1 o'clock. Well, you know, I feel really positive when I, you know, sort of see if someone's available before I call them in their diaries at work and they've got, you know, a slot put out for midday walk. You know, or Pilates. I'm thinking my people have got the message. Yeah. They're looking after themselves. And, I, you know, I wouldn't dream of calling them when they're in that personal space time. And I think, you know, for me, exercise, getting outside is, is just absolutely vital uh, for me. And I haven't, I haven't perhaps done as well as I should last year. And I perhaps haven't stopped enough and, uh, and walked enough, but uh, I'm on a mission now because I'm doing the three peaks in June. So I'm, I'm back on it and I feel so much better for it. So much better for it. I think the point you made about um, knowing yourself is really, really important. And it reminds me of a, an episode we did in February around mental well-being. And there's a chap called uh, Rob Stevenson who's got an app called uh, Form Score. Really simple app. And every day you put in, uh, it'll, it'll, you'll get a notification, you log in. And you rate how you feel on a one to 10 basis, you know, 10 being good. And it, you can put the, in the triggers to that, like your sleep, your energy or whatever. But most importantly, it makes, it makes you spend five seconds just thinking, hang on, how do I actually feel? Uh, and that sounds like an obvious thing, but a lot of people don't do it. So mm -hmm. I recommend that app to anyone. I'm not affiliated to it at all. I just really rate it. Um, Simon, what, what, what are your strategies? Apart from bargain hunt, what's, what's important to you to make sure you're, you're looking after your, your burnout? That, that, that bargain hunt, I mean, I do enjoy bargain but it's about lunch it's about taking that break it's about stepping away and really it's it's reiterating um what, what tracy said in a, in a more formalized way i would say this is something like the five ways to well-being you know what what are we doing around that there's, i just want to say there's a big difference between knowing and doing and i think this is something that we is, is a challenge for people and I, I bet that Nothing that we've particularly talked about today is necessarily new or really new information. So we know this stuff, but why don't we do it? And I think about the five ways to well-being. It's, it's inviting people to kind of build these things into their day. Tracy mentioned um, exercise, and, and I, I think exercise is great. I also think being active, and the, and the five ways is about be active. So it's about movement. It's about sort of doing something. I always go for a walk. Every day, I'll go for a walk. I try and get me 10,000 steps in, be 30 minutes of brisk walk in a day. It's not a lot to have to do. So we've got that being active. We've got take notice. I am a huge fan of mindfulness. 
mindfulness actually changed my life, I would say, sort of 10, 15 years ago when I started to really get into it. And that's about noticing. We can become much more alert to what is actually going on within our bodies if we become mindful of that. So we take notice of that. We also take notice to experience where we are right now in terms of that. I've got, I've got a lovely sunny day um, out, outside and I'm really looking forward to that. We've got keep and learning switching off a little bit i always end the day reading a novel you know sometimes it's a page turner sometimes it's a little bit something a bit heavier but i am finding out something new that isn't about mental health it's something different i've then got um let me just remind myself of it yeah uh connecting with others and this is something that's really interesting because we're working from home how do we connect with others normally we would have water cooler moments I've noticed that I've got at times I've got WhatsApp and Facebook sort of open on, on my because I use Messenger a lot. And if I notice that someone's online, rather than just sort of go send them a quick message, I've done video calls, connecting with them direct, just drop it in for a quick water cooler moment. Because it's really important that we connect with others. We don't get stuck in flow. And then the other thing is give. The fifth one is about give random acts of kindness. I love random acts of kindness. And that might be just sending someone a message. It might be holding the door for some, someone. Um, and I've done that because I'm very fortunate to be able to do this. I've actually bought people shopping before. I mean, not, not a full load of shopping. I've got to say that, well, that, that I'm not that generous. I haven't won the lottery yet. But if someone's only got a few items, I've kind of paid for that. Might seem a little bit weird might seem a little bit random, but that changes. It makes me feel good. It makes them feel good. And maybe they'll pass that on. Mm -hmm. There's loads of daft little things that we can do. I feel daft little things, but these little things make a difference to us and others. And I think it's really important. There's loads of stuff online about the five ways to well-being, And I'd, I'd invite people to just sort of check that, check that out because that gives you loads of top tips about things that you can do. And I think you did a webinar for us on that, didn't you, Simon? So yeah. you could find it in the sewers um, wellness um, playlist. Well. Yeah, yes, there's, there's five separate videos, I think I did, wasn't there? I think they were the very first things you did for us. I did, you'll see me with short hair. <laughs> I think the buying the shopping, uh, I think I've heard of uh, Tim Ferriss doing, saying something similar around uh, buying people coffees, visiting in a coffee shop, just, just paying it forward. It's, it's a nice thing to do. It's, uh, there's no reward other than doing something good. And that, that's, yeah. you know, that's good karma. Yeah. It's yeah, so the other thing. I mean, we mentioned this earlier on. I think Tracy mentioned it. Um, you don't know what's going on in that other person's life. And, and I often use the example of just letting people out of the junction when you're driving. And again, I just invite people to just process how they feel if that other person doesn't wave. And chances are you feel a little bit frustrated, a little bit angry, but you have no idea what is going on for that person in front. Oh, They're not having the worst day Positive, yeah. of their life. Yep. But you are able to kind of just pass that little bit of kindness onto them. Mm -hmm. And it makes you feel good. We shouldn't do these acts for the, re like the reward. The reward is in doing the act itself, not for the acknowledgement of that act. Absolutely. So um, we've just got a couple of minutes left. So I'm just going to finish up with a, a question for each of you. Um, so I'm going to ask you for one part, final piece of advice for the individual and Tracy, one final piece of advice for a business. So Simon, if, if someone's coming to you and they are at burnout, you know, they're at this code red, they're at the burnout point. What, what is the, you know, the one thing you'd say to them that they need to do, think about that, that first bit of advice? Yeah, the first bit about it, the first thing I would say if someone came to me like that is I would thank them. I would thank them for acknowledging that they're feeling that way, and I would thank them for approaching me. And then I would have, I would encourage them and signpost them to the help that's available, because if, if someone's at that stage, then they are going to need some more help. I wouldn't just say to someone, "Well, you need to do the five ways to well-being." That's not going to help. When someone's at that stage, they need some professional support. So if I worked in Suez and that was happening, I would be saying, "Right, you've got we care." What about sort of accessing some of the brilliant support that's available through that? If it's not Suez, then what about the GP? What about some of the NHS 111? Things like that. So at that point, I would be saying, thank you, but let's get you to the help that you need. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Simon. And then to Tracy, if um, a business is looking to begin really creating that, that safe space where, where burnout is prevented, what, where, where does a business start? What would be the first bit of advice you give to a business looking to do that? I think, you know, it can sometimes feel overwhelming looking at this agenda uh, and thinking about all the things that you should or could could do. Um, what we did at Suez back in 2019 was we didn't assume as leaders that we knew what our people wanted. We went out to our people uh, and we had some focus groups and they created our wellness charter uh, with its vision of wellness for all. Every word they wrote, they highlighted the eight domains that they felt were most important in Suez for them as individuals and for us as a business. And that's provided us with a really great framework on which to develop and build our wellbeing agenda. So start with your people and ask them what is important to them and what they need. Otherwise, you're just giving them what you think they need. Um, if they own it, if they've created it, they will engage with it. That's the most important thing. Beyond that, I think start small, and grow from there. So start with one area, uh, get good at it, get engagement on it, let people see that you're taking forward their ideas in that area, and then grow from there. Fantastic. Thanks, Tracy. I'll just point out Ken Pemberton's put in the chat workplace mental health first aid is a great first stop, too. Thanks for that, Ken. I think it's a, it's a really important when we say that, though, about that. Yes, the sort of sewers are using first aid for mental health. There is mental health first aid. They're not necessarily the people to signpost to. They should be signposting on to professionals. This isn't about if people at the burnout stage, they're going to need professional help. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, um, we, we really need to be careful with that, that we're not burdening again those people with. But either if it's a certificate like the first aid, uh, mental health first aid or the qualification first aid for mental health, it's still a signposting service. It's not a listening service. There are professionals out there to kind of do that. Incredibly important that it's there within the organisation. I absolutely agree with that. But we need to be careful that people aren't overburdened by things. Yeah, the, it's a massive responsibility, it is. It is. Uh, helping someone who could be heading towards crisis. And one of the reasons I engaged Simon was we felt along the same lines. We actually don't like the term uh, mental health first aiders. Um, we wish it was something different. Um, but uh, and that's why we went with the uh, sort of alternative training that uh, Simon provides, which is... Um, you know, uh, certificated and tested yeah. at the end of the training, but that that doesn't make you someone who's capable of dealing with someone at a crisis point. But it's great for raising awareness in yourself and others. Great for helping you engage and start a conversation with others, and great to know when those flags are there. That actually, do you know what? I need to help this person get to the support that they need. Gotcha. Thanks, absolutely Tracy. Absolutely agree with what you've said there, Tracy. Yeah, absolutely. So we're just coming off to the top of our, the hour. So, um, Tracy, thanks so much for today. If anyone wants to reach out to you after this, either from the webinar or on the podcast, what's the best way for them to do so? Oh, I'm on LinkedIn. So, you know, anybody who wants to connect with me or they want to get access to all the wellbeing webinars, over 40 of them we've created at Suez. They're all there for everybody to access. Just, just drop me a note or, or follow through one of the links uh, to those webinars that I've shared because you'll find the whole list of them there when you go in. Thanks, a lot. Yeah. thanks, Tracy. And Simon, to yourself, what's, what's, if anyone wants to reach out, what's the best way for them to do so with you? I'm going to say probably LinkedIn as well. Um, I, I'm on LinkedIn. It's it's Simon Richardson. and uh, Or you can go to the website. We, we've got Golden Tree CIC because we're a community interest company. Uh, so it's www.goldentreecic.co.uk. And you've got stuff on the training that we do and you can send us a, a contact message and we're more than happy to get in touch with you. Fantastic. Well, look, Simon, Tracy, thanks so much for today. I know how busy you are, so thank you so much for the, for the, uh, the ideas and the, and, the, and the thoughts and the advice you've given today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, everyone, thanks for everyone who's attended today. Um, next week, uh, we will be discussing taking our workforce on a journey of purpose, how to engage your employees to make sure they're part of your mission 
and invested in it because it's so important in 2021 that your people uh, believe in where you're going and they feel they're a part of that journey. Uh, but thanks again, everyone. Hope you have a great week, great weekend, and I'll see you all next week.